Hey, Cider Crusaders, America's the greatest country in the world. Glad you're here. We have a ton to do today. Super excited. We're going to talk to Amity Schlaes uh, and also Derek Green talk about Booker T. Washington. So really excited for our history-based show. And a pretty good segue. Uh, I wrote this book a year ago. It's a kid's book. It's uh, called Imagine Jack and the History Kids. And the reason I'm mentioning it now is because it's on Amazon, and every month I have to pay Amazon fees, and they're upping the fees, and I'm kind of just done paying them. So it's we got a barn burner sale going on right now. Just search for Imagine Jack and the History Kids. The very, very short of it is about this kid Jack who's bored playing video games. So his mom says, go outside, use your imagination. And then he interacts with all these different uh, kids who then turn into different historical figures. Let me just do one here real quick. So they get to a, uh, a river, and they can't get across the river. See? And there, here comes George on his dad's fishing boat. And then they turn the page and but it's George Washington. And they're crossing the river and they encounter a bunch of other historical figures. And they got to get home by dinner and they can't get home quick enough. So then they meet up with Neil Armstrong and they get in their soapbox derby and they blast home and then talk about the grand adventures they had using their imagination. It's probably for ages 1 to 12 because there's pretty big words in it. So there's a pretty big range of, uh, of, of age appropriateness. There. You just search for Imagine Jack and the History Kids and it's on um, Amazon right now, 1776. Um, sometimes I say the price and people are like, wait, why? And I was like, you know what? The book's not for you. Don't worry about it. Okay. If you know why, then the book's for you. Um, so did you notice the uh, big rally in Brooklyn this weekend? It wasn't a Black Lives Matter rally. It was a Black Trans Lives Matter. <laughs> That's what the rally was like. Wait, what? What did this... So this is intersectionality, and we'll talk about that another day. You may already know uh, the gist of it, but the idea is we're moving past race. Remember we talked about this all last week. Like Race is just the thing now, but the tactics that are being used now are going to be used um, forever now. This is the new playbook. Race just happens to be the topic of, of last week. But So here's, here's moving past Black Lives Matter, and now Black Trans Lives Matter, and then now it's every oppressed group in America. Uh, I saw a rally outside of, I think it was the mayor of D.C.'s house, and the police were all lined up in front, big crowd around, it turned into a big old dance party. And I'm going to spare you the dancing video, okay, from this person. Uh, but if you just, I think we did a, we got a freeze frame, we got a still shot of this, right? Okay, so I'm not going to show you any video of that person dancing, you're welcome. But if you look in the way bottom background, the bottom right-hand corner, it says decriminalize sex work, she safe, we safe. <laughs> okay. And it's like, wait, Black Lives Matter rally. <laughs> decriminalize. So what do we So now we're now officially in the phase of it's just game on with every progressive cause that there is. And I just imagine like <laughs> your average suburban soccer mom chanting Black Lives Matter last week, and now her and her daughter are on this bus, the Black Lives Matter bus, and all of a sudden the leaders of the bus are chanting Black Trans Lives Matter. And the, the mom's like, wait, I'm sorry, wait, what, where are we? What did you say? Black, hmm? Black what? That's not exactly what I signed, what I signed up for. <laughs> Crazy. So, so all of this has, uh, is born out of and has festered on our college campuses for decades now. I read an article this weekend uh, about Peter Thiel. Peter Thiel, the, the billionaire, founder of PayPal with Elon Musk, among other things. Remember Peter Thiel? He was the guy who spoke at the Republican convention for Trump. Um, he's gay, uh, Silicon Valley guy, is a huge deal. And he's super smart. So one of Peter Thiel's efforts a couple years back was to start the Thiel Fellowship, which pays kids not to go to college. So they take these, these promising uh, kids who, who want to go actually do things as opposed to just going to college. And well, here, uh, here's the quote from, uh, this is from the article. Uh, and this is in the City Journal. The American collegiate system, Thiel, his staff, and his, fellow, uh, his fellows unanimously affirm, can be, has become a giant scam transforming potential innovators into subservient drones, indoctrinating the disruptors of tomorrow into Marxist myths of resentment, and using the social justice buzzwords of class privilege and structural oppression to crush the spirit. Like American prog progressivism, they say the university is rotten from the inside out, uh, and it needs to be burned to the ground, figuratively speaking, so that something new and better can be built from its ashes. All of this ideology has festered on colleges' campaigns for decades, and and we've legitimized it all this time, and it's grown, and entire departments and bureaucracies are, are existent, and tons of money. <laughs> There's so much graft and money to, to be made throughout all this. And it's just too big for college campuses now, so now it's K through 12 and, and even beyond. 
Let me back it up here a minute just to, to kind of beam up the show here uh, today. There's a man, I just came across him, uh, Milan Kundera. He lived under Soviet oppression, like real oppression, not America oppression. I heard someone the other day say, hating America is like hating your parents for not buying you a jet ski. Okay, so this guy lived under real oppression. Uh, and this is what he said. He said, the first step in liquidating a people is to erase its memory, destroy its books, its culture, its history. Then if somebody write new books, manufacture a new culture, invent a new history, and before long, that nation will begin to forget what it is and what it was. And the world around it will forget even faster. So Ewan Morrison wrote a, an essay about him, and uh, Ewan makes the point that with the internet, when the internet was first invented, we dreamed that we could digitize the knowledge of the world and everything would be at your fingertips. And you would just have this infinite library of everything at your disposal. And we'd just be, become so wise and we'd just learn and read and read and learn and grow. Uh, but Ewan says the glass house of truth and the glow, we, we would let the glass house of truth and, and free and, and uh, what is it? We, the glass house of truth and the global village of free information flow. That's what it's the glass house of truth and the global village of free information flow. And the future would be a time of endless remembrance and of great learning. But instead, the internet has become a tool of forgetting, not remembrance. And think, think about this. This is so amazing to me. Everything is available to you. Everything. Back in the day, nothing was available to you. Right? The Bible wasn't available. Right? Back in the day, before the printing press, there were no Bibles, right? There's like a few hand... I was going to say they were really expensive, but they weren't even expensive. You couldn't buy it. There's a few handwritten ones, right? That's it. So there was no Bible. Even if you did have one, it was in Latin, and you couldn't read Latin. And then you go to church, and that was in Latin, and you didn't no Latin. So, like, even the Bible wasn't available to you. It's online for free. Right now, the Bible's online for free. Do you read it? It's right there. You can go to any church in the country and you say, can I have a Bible? And they'll just hand you one for free in English. And you know how to read English. So do you read it? No. There's, ne there's never been things so available and so far away to the point where it might as well not even exist, right? It might as well not even exist. What's the old line? It's like uh, that the man who does not read good books is no better than the man who can't. If you can read and you don't, then you're no better off than the person who can't read. But this, this not wanting to learn thing, this is not normal. This is, it's, I think, I believe you are born, I mean, just think of kids. Kids are always asking questions and wanting to absorb their sponges. They want to learn as much as possible. That's normal. And that has to get beaten out of you as we grow older. Why? I'm reading a, uh, rereading uh, his biography of Josiah Henson. It's, it's awesome. Buy this book right now. It's so good. Uh, Josiah Henson was the man who was the inspiration for Uncle Tom's Cabin which arguably sparked the Civil War and, and ended slavery. So Josiah was a slave, and when he was a boy, there was another slave in charge of bringing the master's sons to and from school, right? So he would ride the horse, and they'd be in the carriage in the back, and, and the, this other slave boy would, would uh, ride the kid, drive the kids to school, right? And that slave learned how to read and write just by listening to the master's kids talk about their lessons behind them. So this slave knew how to read and write, and Josiah wanted to. So he asked him if he could teach him how to read. And the other slave said, yes, but you got to go buy this book. So Josiah's is like a little kid. He's like eight years old. Now, one of Josiah's jobs was to go to the market and sell his master's crops. So Josiah, over time, would take a couple apples that fell from the tree, and he'd pick them off the ground, put them in his pockets. And he'd go to market and sell all the other things, right? And on the side, he'd sell these apples. And it, right, it wouldn't affect the inventory because he picked them himself, right? So he got enough money, and he went and he bought a book. It was like a dictionary kind of like book. And he put it in his pocket, and he carried it around. So a couple days later, 
He had the book in his pocket, and he was taking care of the master's horse, and the horse reared up, and Josiah fell backwards, and the book fell out of his pocket. And it was a scene just out of a movie, right? Josiah noticed the book, the master noticed the book at the same time, and as Josiah went to grab it, the master took his cane and boom, right on top of the book. They had a uh, little discussion about it, and the master beat him for having it. And in particular, there was one giant swing of the stick right on Josiah's head, nearly killed him, left him with brain damage for his entire life. Josiah, for daring to read, Josiah did not pick up another book for 30 years after that. But then when he did, <laughs> then when he did, he absorbed as much as he could again, just like, just like when he was a child. I share this story because the lengths that young Josiah went to learn the lengths he went to learn. He inherently knew how important education was, that education is freedom. He knew that they could enslave my body, but no one can ever enslave my mind unless I let them, unless we let them out of ignorance. The lengths he went to learn and read, and today the lengths people go to not read, to be ignorant. In the ghetto, if you want to read and learn, you're acting white. And the people who push that culture, they're, they're, they're no better than Josiah Henson's slave master. They're no better. Keeping people from reading, keeping them in ignorance. Did you see the exchange that yesterday? There's some activist in London, and she's on the Independent Police Advisory Board or whatever, and she didn't know who Winston Churchill was. <laughs> okay? If like, especially if you're in England, you need to know who Winston Churchill was. But that's what Kundera said. The first step in liquidating a people is to erase its memory. Winston Churchill who? Destroy its books, its culture, its history. And before long, that nation will begin to forget what it is and what it was. And that's the point of the progressive movement, to do that. Two historians on the show today, Amity Schlaes to talk about the Great Society and Derek Green to talk about Booker T. Washington. And a great primer for your kids. Imagine Jack and history kids. True story. Mike Slayer, spread the word. Hey, Slayer Crusaders. So the uh, all this tearing of everything down, statues, books, the whole thing, it's nothing new. It's nothing unique, I should say. This has happened forever through all of history. The Cultural Revolution in China, we gotta get an expert on to tell us all about this, but um, Mao, well, the Red Guard, who were just mostly teenagers during the Cultural Revolution, they destroyed 5,000 years of Chinese culture, right? Like 300 years of America, like that's a piece of cake. They destroyed 5,000 years of Chinese culture. Taoist, Confucian, Buddhist temples, shrines, scrolls, paintings, sculptures, everything all destroyed. Every culture's done this. They've had their version of it. The Romans had what they called damnatio memoriae. And it meant, it was, it was the worst fate. Like if you betrayed your country, this was, your, this was what you received. This was your punishment. And it meant your name and face were removed from everything, right? So your face was chiseled from statues. Your name was removed from inscriptions. All of your writings were destroyed and, and everything. Like you're, you, it's, you never even existed. So it was a fate worse than death because you were removed from history like you never were born. And we have our own version of that today, right? Mobs tearing down uh, statues, but also canceling people. I mean, you've heard this is like the term, this is the progressive term, like, oh, that person needs to be canceled. Like yesterday, the head of, uh, or the head coach of uh, Oklahoma State needs to be canceled because he was wearing the wrong t-shirt, right? We gotta cancel him. Very similar to Damnatio Memoria, right? Uh, why do people do this? Very simply, if you're not building things, it feels really good to tear things down. And if you're not improving yourself, it feels really good to tear other people down. John Cleese uh, tweeted this out yesterday. The, the tweet was something like, I don't know if this was recorded 30, 30 years or 10 minutes ago. Here's part of the video. Seriously though, we've heard a lot about extremism recently, a nastier, harsher atmosphere everywhere, more abuse and bother boy behavior, less friendliness and tolerance and respect for opponents. All right, but what we never hear about extremism is its advantages. Well, the biggest advantage of extremism is that it makes you feel good. 
because it provides you with enemies. Let me explain. The great thing about having enemies is that you can pretend that all the badness in the whole world is in your enemies and all the goodness in the whole world is in you. Attractive, isn't it? So, if you have a lot of anger and resentment in you anyway, and you therefore enjoy abusing people, then you can pretend that you're only doing it because these enemies of yours are such very bad persons. And that if it wasn't for them, you'd actually be good-natured and courteous and rational all the time. So, if you want to feel good, become an extremist. Okay. That's so good. Uh, the problem is we should be building, we should be raising our kids to be building things. Because like building things feels good, right? Achievement feels good. Being someone who lived a life that's, that, that a society deems is worthy of building a statue to, that feels good. Tearing things down shouldn't feel good. And it only does if you don't know what building things feels like. I want to take an early break here because I want to leave plenty of time for our guests. Uh, but let me throw one thing out here your way. Uh, I agree with Larry O'Connor that we need to take the term back. What term? Black Lives Matter. We got to take that slogan. I shouldn't say take it back. We got to take it away from them. Right? Because the comeback, you know, Black Lives Matter, and then the comeback was, no, all lives matter. Okay? Well, now that's racist to say you can't say that. So I've heard some people say, well, all black lives matter, which is like a nod to Chicago, right? But... And that's fine, but I'm, I just take it over completely. Just take it over. Black Lives Matter. Everyone knows the Democrats have been running these cities for literally 50 plus years. So generation after generation after generation. Can they claim Black Lives Matter? Conservatives need to take the expression. What about uh, Black Education Matters? The left has failed our kids uh, more than any other force in our nation through our education system. Right, people talk about how, bad it, how difficult it is to fire bad cops because of the unions. Try firing a bad teacher. Every year in California, there's like 130,000 teachers in California, something like that. Every year, due to poor performance, the state fires two. Two teachers a year in California are fired because of bad performance out of 100,000. Right? It's impossible to fire a bad teacher. And I think bad teachers might even do more damage to more people than, than bad cops. So Black Lives Matter. Let's have school choice. Larry makes, I mean, we're talking about Booker T. Washington coming up in a little bit. He would agree with that, certainly. And so, you know, Larry makes the point, uh, if the system's so racist, why would black people want the racist government in charge of education? If the Black Lives Matter folks were genuine, they'd be calling for more school choice. Conservatives believe black churches matter, or just church, right? You'd think that the, the black churches would be skeptical of a movement that's rooted in Marxism. Right? They'd be skeptical of a movement that never even attempts to quote scripture or any biblical truth whatsoever. You think they'd be skeptical of a movement that believes Christianity is an oppressive force in the world? So black lives matter. Also, black lives matter, black jobs matter. Let's get rid of the taxes and regulations that make it harder for, for black people and all people to open up businesses. Black lives matter. Black families matter. Right? Margaret Sanger was a racist eugenicist who wanted to kill black babies, the undesirables. That was her stated goal of Planned Parenthood is to kill black people. And now she's praised as a hero from the left today. Uh, no, no, wait. black lives matter. Conservatives believe in criminal justice reform. Absolutely, we're gonna dedicate our Friday special to that. I mean, of course we're, we're for criminal justice reform because we don't like the government at all, ever, <laughs> right? By our nature, we don't. Like, people are like, talking about defunding the government or defund uh, uh, police. I say defund everything. Today, Black Lives Matter means one thing, and it's, it's not good. It's all a compila compilation of not good things. So I say we take it over and give it its true, proper definition. Make it a whole new rallying cry. Amity Schles, coming up next. Spread the word. Hey, Slider Crusaders, what an honor to talk to our next guest, one of my absolute favorite writers, this is so cool, four New York Times bestsellers, The Greedy Hand, Coolidge, The Forgotten Man, her newest book, she's the chairman of the Coolidge Foundation as well. The book, the new book is Great Society, A New History, Miss Amity Schles. Amity, how are you today? I'm fine, how are you? So good, and it's so good to talk to you. Um, 
We have a ton to do. Let me, let me ask you a big question before we get to the book. As a historian, I've been hearing so much lately about rewriting history and you know this whole critical lens of history and all this. So you as a historian, for instance, when you see a statue being torn down, how does that make you feel? What do you, what do, you do with that? Well, just because you remove the image of evil doesn't mean you remove evil. In fact, you make the repetition of evil more likely. I mean, statues um, honor past figures, but they also remind us of their characters and all they did and invite discussion. So there's no statue, there's no memory. There's kind of an idea that America had a perfect history, if you're a skeptical person. Is statues aren't just there for adulation, they're ver- there for contemplation. That's why it's so dangerous mm-hmm. to remove them. I love that line, they're for contemplation. What about right. uh, yeah, moving even away from statues? Like, I'm not, I'm not going to ask, put you on the spot f- to talk about the another, 1619 let's project. Another analogy. Like, um, if you went to Germany and you looked at the statues of the past from before Hitler, and you said, which of these guys was an anti Semite? The answer is all of them. But Jews can take a lot from past German history. Even German history they don't particularly like. They can learn a lot from figures who are anti-Semitic, even if they, uh, of course, um, it's tragic those figures were anti-Semitic. Even Jews can learn from anti-Semites, scientists, for example, or political figures who happen to be wrong about anti-Semitism. Germany would have no history if you took away everyone who was anti-Semitic. Germany needs its history, uh, if only to understand national, so- if only to understand national socialism, which came later. So you kind of, when you erase history, all you do is create a vacuum. Uh, and, and the second point being, then when a new evil comes along, maybe it is not recognized because there is no old evil uh, to which to compare it. Oh yes, that's the answer, of course. The, the 1619 Project, I don't want to ask you to, on that particular, but that's a classic rewriting of history, right? Literally redefining America's founding. That's a bold effort. <laughs> uh, so as a historian, how do you view things like that, attempts like that to rewrite history? Well, it's always go, good to go back to history and see if you miss something. For example, I'm Coolidge's biographer, but I'm well certain that I missed some aspects of his life just because I didn't find them. So the more you find, the more must be displayed. And um, history's never finished. There's always more to find, and that's great. But what we're doing in history is facts. We're not doing opinion. So, So that's important to remember. And if we don't like the facts or the presentation of the facts heretofore, we, we can represent them, hopefully add more facts. But it's not, um, history is not a mostly opinion, it's mostly facts. That's my, that's my last big picture question, then we'll get to the book, Amity. Um, it's <laughs> the older I'm getting, the harder it is, well, the more respect I have for historians and the more difficult I find the job to be. Um, Because you take someone maybe more complicated like a Christopher Columbus, and you have people who are sharing completely different stories of Christopher Columbus, for instance. And it's like, geez, how is a historian to make sense of this person? We have trouble interpreting what's happening right now in front of us, let alone things that happened a long time ago. Um, So that's very difficult. How do you do that? How do you get closer to the truth as a historian? Really, honestly, uh, it's become much more exciting and more interesting with the rise of the searchable PDF. That's very important. (laughs) Of uh, the ability to look at video. There's a lot of video of Coolidge, for example, that I wasn't even able to look at when Coolidge was being written, my book, in 2013. Now, uh, the Library of Congress has posted some things. We've posted some things. It's great. So... Uh, you know, that one is go to the sources, and the sources are not all dug up yet. That's very important. Um, I'm trying to think what your other question was. I'm sorry. Just how difficult it is to know the truth, especially when things look took a long time ago, right? And, and how do you not bring your biases and, and, and paint the, the full story best you can? 
Well, it's sort of like journalism. Uh, journalists, you can never know all the truth, but you can know as much as you can. And and to believe truth exists, to it, mm. to believe truth exists improves journalism, even if you never capture a hundred percent truth. If you strive for truth, you get closer to truth. That's the way history is. If you yeah. throw your hands up and say it's all relative, let's go to political science or philosophy, um, you're you're being lazy. Yeah, you're not setting yourself up for success, that's for sure. Uh, okay, let's talk about the book. The, go ahead. On the truth front. I mean, yeah. it, digging, I, I, we just had this discussion this morning because President Coolidge was not very nice to his son, John. Uh, the son lived where another son died. President Coolidge kind of took it out on him, and he said things to him that we would not accept today, Coolidge said to his son, John. Should we mention that? Hmm. How um, probably how important it is is it to the portrait of Coolidge? Not that important. A lot of us are mean to our children from time to time. So, you know, he didn't beat John. He just undermined him. What family? In what family does that not happen? Still, it's good to know. It gives you an idea of uh, kind of New England toughness, which is what it was in mm-hmm. part of pre-Freudian toughness. Uh, so I like to know everything. Um, I like to read it, leave it to the reader to evaluate. The author pre-evaluates. So uh, some of that's in my book. Uh, you can fight about whether I have enough of Coolidge's uh, contempt for John or um, occasional contempt or too much. That's that's for the reader. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about The Great Society, uh, a new history. Uh Well, there you go, a new history. (laughs) What do you think was missing? What context was missing uh, from previous discussions of the Great Society? Well, um, hope is not evidence, right? So so when we look at the Great Society, there's a lot of hope there, and it's very lovable. And today we also live in a hopeful period. This, The early 60s were a period of idealism. This is a period of idealism. Um, Mm. That's nice. But what we tend to neglect and suppress is the evidence that the idealism of the 1960s wasn't especially productive. Um, For example, Lyndon Johnson said he was going to cure poverty, C-U-R-E, cure. He didn't say make poverty a little better. He said cure. He did not cure poverty. In fact, the decrease in poverty uh, tended to decelerate after the Great Society. So Johnson didn't say, I'm going to make a good society. He said, I'm going to make a great society. The ambition is very similar to today. Um, Perhaps that ambition, the evidence does suggest, uh, is part of the problem. Um, If you want to make something perfect, you make um, the perfect the enemy of the good, and then you have disappointment. Specifically, I'll give an example. Currently, we're discussing. Uh, give an example. Currently, we're discussing community action. We basically are um, disappointed, disillusioned with an in police, and we want to have the community lead improvement in the community. Something's wrong in the community. We need the community there. Maybe we need federal help with the community. That's what you're going to see uh, in coming months with le- legislation. In the 1960s, there was the same attitude, more or less. Uh, People didn't trust local authorities, police or mayors, town offices. Uh, The police weren't defunded, but they were sidelined often in the 1960s by the Great Society federal programs. What happened? The money that flowed to the communities didn't necessarily help the communities, and it institutionalized protests. That is, we sent money to create offices in towns um, that supported protests. And um, so all of a sudden protesters were on federal money. And the mayor said, wait a minute, this is my town. Why is my town being paid by Washington to protest me when I am elected? Who elected the Economic Opportunity Community Action Office? No one. And and the mayor's had a point. Uh, so so political groups from outside come in with funding, not just to protest, but to open social work offices. We spent a lot of money on social work in the 1960s, just as we would now, and you're hearing talk about social work. 
that ended up becoming, as Daniel Patrick Moynihan said, feeding the horses to feed the sparrows. That is, a lot of money went into the social work establishment, the horses, and the sparrows, the people who are frail, fragile, might need help, got very little. Feeding the horses to feed the sparrows. So we had a whole, I guess the point is we had a whole learning cycle about this. We said, oh, let's send money and community, let's send community action, that doesn't work. Let's send money, that doesn't necessarily work. Um, A lot of times the rules for the money are counterproductive. In that period, we supported single moms, but not families. And we've all known what that's done to families. Um, Then we said uh, a guaranteed income, a version of sending money. We, it, it turned out to be very expensive. Then we said build houses somewhere along there. We built many ugly houses and moved people out of neighborhoods they liked, um, as we had already done a, a decade before. Um, then we said the Great Society was wrong and people should own houses, not just rent. Mm. And I think personally, I think that was probably right. We didn't get it perfect. And 2008, in part, was a function of um, us, uh, the country, um, coaxing people into housing they couldn't afford through subsidy or um, simple misrepresentation. But it, m- the evidence from the 60s suggests, doesn't prove, but suggests that ownership is very, very important for Americans. And when people own something literally as property or as a sense of community, uh, communities do better. Yeah, You mentioned distrusting local governments. What have you learned about human nature? Uh, by studying Coolidge, so thir- you know, 30s and now 50s, 60s. What have you learned about human nature that leads people to distrust local government, but then trust the federal government? <laughs> like, why do, why do people make that illogical jump? Well, there's one instance in our history that stands out where the federal government was better than the local government. That would be the South in the United States because blacks could not vote, black Americans. I mean, in the early 60s, you might have a town where only two in 10 black people voted who could vote, eligible to vote. They could, often weren't taught to read well enough. The schools were inferior. The South let the black American community down. Then we had federal intervention in the Great Society. We had the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, which was very specific um, targeting the South and particularly Southern black representation at the Democratic National Convention, which was uh, underserved up until 1968 at least. Um, Okay, that's an area where the federal government was perhaps necessary because the South didn't do it itself for a long time from the Civil War all the way to the 60s, a century of failure by the South. The South wouldn't like to admit that, um, it's hard to concede, but that's a problem. Um, the But often elsewise, what we did was take that model, intervene in the South and carry it all over the country. That's how we got nice. mandatory school busing, for example, which some of us are old enough to remember, at least have heard about, right? Where people were moved vast distances, little kids to schools where they had no friends and couldn't have a play date, black or white, both were lonely. <laughs> And parents were estranged from the community school because it was no longer their school. Their school was somewhere across town where they didn't know any of the teachers or or feel comfortable in the schoolyard, the parents. So really weird federal projects. That came from a federal court decision, of course, um, or several. Uh, So um, a lot of the time, the majority of the time, federal intervention is bad because the federal government doesn't know the locale. If a a town needs a gym, the federal government sends it French lessons. You know, I I just, I hope people, I I, I hate to cut you off, Amity. I got 30 seconds. I just want to ask you one last question, but I I just hope people will learn that lesson to stop going to the federal government for for assistance here, even if it did work that one time. Uh, The last question for you, Amity. What do you want people to get from this book? Why is your book on the Great Society important today? And we only got about 30 seconds. I hate to do that to you. Uh, Nothing is new. It's just forgotten. We're repeating the 60s now unfortunately, in terms of policy. And uh, planners uh, are overrated. Just because something's new doesn't mean it's better. Oh, that's good. Yeah, and nothing new under the sun. All right, beautiful. Amity Schles, 
Great Society, A New History, just came out, go buy it. Uh, Amity, okay. wonderful to talk to you. Please keep up the great work. Oh, thanks for talking. I appreciate it. Thank you, ma'am. True story, Mike Thank Slater. You. We're gonna talk, talk about Booker T. Washington next. Spread the word. Hey, Cider Crusaders, I can think of no better way, truly, and no better person to talk about to wrap up our show that really inadvertently has been dedicated to history than to talk about Booker T. Washington. Uh, Derek Green is from Project 21, and he made an amazing Prager University video just the other day about Booker T. Washington, and this is a man we all need to know and need to think about often. Uh, Derek, how are you, brother? Doing fantastic. How are you? Man, really good to talk to you, and, and thanks for bringing Booker T. Washington back. Uh, what, I don't, do we want to do a quick bio? I mean, I hate to do a disservice to the man uh, who has an incredible biography, but maybe give us like the 60 second of Booker T. Washington that we can go a little deeper. Sure, sure. Uh, Booker T. Washington uh, was born into slavery. Uh, he was free from slavery. And one of his, his, one of his first goals that he wanted to accomplish after he was free from slavery was to go to school to learn how to read. And uh, because of circumstances that were in his his family uh, in his immediate environment, he was unable to go to school immediately. But he had to go work in in salt mines. But eventually, his wow. resolve, his determination to go to school and be educated, won out. And so he he went to uh, school. He learned how to read. Uh, and then after he learned how to read, what he wanted to do, what he saw was his life's work, was educating and civilizing uh, the the recently freed. Uh, slaves to not only educate them and teach them how to read and write, but also to teach them uh, how to how to uh, uh, demonstrate dignity, cleanliness, thrift, economy, upstanding character. So he he basically was teaching teaching people in his in his local uh, uh, neighborhood in his in his uh, city. Uh, but what his life work was in terms of educating, he saw at uh, the Tuskegee Institute in Alabama. And that is one of what we call the historically black colleges and universities in which he built the the school from the ground up with the help of the students uh, that were in Literally built it. Literally, Literally built, built it. Uh, <laughs> not just the buildings, but they built their beds, they built their desks, they built the the, wow. uh, the basically the commissary where they went to eat. Uh, they built everything, and so it was it was part of a, a, a significant accomplishment not only in his life but the lives of the students that he sought to educate and to lead. And so that was his life's work, and and Tuskegee is still around. Uh, and he gave one uh, a pretty much a, a, a historical speech in Atlanta in 1895, uh, in which he sought to allay the fears of white Southerners, but also uh, uh, discuss with them uh, not re resisting economic opportunity for the re recently free blacks. And so that speech has gone down in history because at the time it was very well accepted, but after several years later, uh, the speech was derided uh, as the Atlanta Compromise. And so because of that that uh, denigration of that speech, uh, Booker T. Washington and his accomplishments uh, and his contribution to history uh, was seemingly wiped out. And so what I wanted to do is to kind of resurrect who Booker T. Washington was, uh, place him back you know, on the, the you know, symbolic Mount Rushmore of, of, of American blacks, but also, you know, just Americans. Uh, so we can celebrate his contribution, not only to the country, but what he did to, as he frequently said throughout his life, to uplift the race. Yeah, no doubt about it. No, no question. He's in the running for one of our, one of our greatest Americans ever. Um, mm. Was there a pivotal moment in his childhood or young adulthood that made him want to serve others, right? Because it's one thing to want to get an education yourself, but where did the inspiration to, to serve others come from? It's interesting because he, he discusses in his life that he was uh, a religious man, a Christian, but he wasn't overly spiritual. He, he, it seemed like he got his, uh, his Christianity from an intellectual, uh, the intellectual aspect of Christianity and the morality that was in Christianity that he could help others. And so what I think for him, having you know, been born into slavery, having been freed and then seeing the almost the terror in the faces of his fellow freedmen who were happy and jubilant that they were free, but did not know how to, what first and second and third steps to take in this new life of freedom. They just didn't know what to do 
or how to live. And so I think that he sympathized uh, a great deal with people who were begging and longing and praying for freedom, but then gra- having it granted and not knowing what to do. Uh, he says several right, times so- in his autobiography. Oh, go ahead. Please go ahead. He says several times in his autobiography, and I'm paraphrasing, uh, that people who help others are the happiest in life, and people who refuse to help others are the most miserable. And I think he internalized that uh, throughout his life from, again, from the night schools that he, he taught at the very beginning all the way through the time that he, he retired from uh, Tuskegee uh, University. Yeah, that's so good. So uh, twofold question. So what were some of these morals that were so important to him? And then how did he ever know these morals in the first place? Right. So I think some of the morals, I think it, it, on a ground level, I think that the uh, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you or love your neighbor as yourself. He never fully articulates that, but he does discuss, and, and there's a couple other books that discusses while he's going around to travel to speak to, you know, black congregations and and and, and white audiences, that his, some of his most enjoyable time was in uh, black churches. And so I think he internalized a lot of the, the Christian morality that he heard in that, that in those particular environments. Again, he wasn't an overly spiritual man, but he was able to glean that doing for others was the best way to put them on the track for a constructive life uh, in freedom. And so I think that's kind of what, what he saw. Uh, I, I think another thing that was really made an impression upon him was, again, just having grown up in slavery and seeing that change from how people would treat fellow members of the human race as if they weren't people. Uh, and then after slavery was over, seeing that kind of animosity build back up in the same people who formerly enslaved uh, fellow blacks. I think that he put those two things together and said, this is no way for us to live. And so I, I you know, thank God that he was able to do that. And he, re- he remarks over and over in his, his autobiography, uh, the idea that, that it's, 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 we're called to do good things for other people in essence. And it's, it's just very, very interesting that he was in, able to internalize that. Again, not an overly religious man, but he was able to internalize the principles for that and then to set that foundation up for others to follow. So he wasn't just doing it for his fellow man. He was teaching his fellow man who he was educating and civilizing to do it for other people. That was the only way that the South and he thought was going to rise above the level of, of where they were in terms of, uh, of formerly having slave people was that there was an interconnectivity between the blacks who were recently freed and the whites who had recently uh, been slave owners. Yes, yeah, so good. Um, and not the easy path to take, that's for sure, but, but I think all. the, the right all. one. What if you, I could ask this two ways. Uh, mm-hmm. let, let, me, let me really put you in a tough spot. If Booker T. Washington <laughs> came alive again today and went oh. to a Black Lives Matter protest <laughs> and got the microphone, what, right. what would he tell the crowd? What's well, interesting, I, it's funny. I don't think that he would go to a Black Lives Matter protest. I think that yeah. <laughs> I think that what they're 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 advocating and the way they're going about uh, advocating and airing their grievances uh, is, is provides a stark contrast from what Booker T. Washington taught in his life. One of the things that he said is that he that that blacks had to be careful not to uh, be in in a, in a in a in a source of constant complaining. Otherwise, we will be seen as, that's the only way that blacks will be seen as constant complainers and people who just want to air their grievances. We should not let our grievances uh, uh, um, overlook or, 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 or overshadow our opportunities. And so I don't think that he would go to a Black Lives Matter protest. However, what I think that he would say is, simply, as he said in the speech, cast down your buckets where you are. You have enough opportunity. Yeah. You guys are living in the land of opportunity in ways that I could only dream, that I could only imagine. It's time for you to make the most of the opportunities that you've been given to make the most of yourselves. And I think that what he would tell them uh, very clearly, if not at the protest, but in some form of writing or speech of his own, is that as the, the, the one of the principles that he lived by was that we cannot agitate through politics alone. We have to take advantages of economic opportunities, academic opportunities. We have to fortify our families and have a very good foundation to teach our children uh, how to live. So they, we can instill upon them the certain ideas, attitudes, thoughts, behaviors that are gonna make them successful uh, in this land of opportunity. And so I think that he would definitely guard against agitation, uh, but tell us that we have a lot of opportunities, opportunities that didn't exist when he was coming up, 
so that we should take advantage of those to not only improve ourselves as individuals, but approve our, improve ourselves as Americans as well. Mm. So good. Okay, we only have two minutes, so I'm gonna, you've inspired me to share the cast down the buckets where you are story. We'll do that mm. tomorrow though, when we have a little more time, but that's so good. Um, all right, help me out with this, Derek, on that point. Mm -hmm. So I'm reading the I'm rereading this book about Josiah Henson, who was the mm. inspiration for Uncle Tom's Cabin. Amazing sto story, mm. very similar to, to Booker T's in a lot of ways. So mm. I hear that. <laughs> help me understand this. I hear someone complaining about uh, 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 some injustice committed today, and my first instinct is to go back to a Booker T. Washington, and be like, "Oh, you working in the salt mines? You were slave, former slave, work, right?" Is that a, I don't think that's super healthy, right? So I'm going to put your the theology degree to work here as well. Like, what's a more appropriate uh, there's truth there, right? Like, hey, you're not a slave. You're not Booker T. Washington. You have way more opportunities than he did. So consider mm -hmm. yourself like, but also to have the empathy of like, oh, this is still an injustice. How do you balance those two? It's interesting because one of the things that he he remarked about a lot in his autobiography was his uh, just his his life size respect for General Armstrong Ar Armstrong who started Hampton where he attended school uh, and helped guide him as he as he started Tuskegee. He fought in the Civil War and he said, "I never heard General Armstrong utter a word in private or public an ill will against." Uh, Southern white men. And, and what he internalized was that is that he could never allow a person to bring him so low as to hate someone else. So I think the, the, the principle that he uh, uh, embodied and one, one of the things that I would love to see people of all races, but particularly American blacks, is to embody the idea of forgiveness, that we understand that injustices have, been, have happened historically, but we have to forgive those things, not to forget, but to forgive those those things in history and move on. Similarly, we cannot attribute to people today sins that were committed in the past. We can't hold people accountable. The Bible says that each man should die for his own sins. And so I think that if we were to embrace a forgiveness and then not try to attribute sins to people who did not commit them, that forgiveness is the foundation for reparation of relationships, with th which then leads to reconciliation, which then leads, particularly in the American church, a very viable program to demonstrate how we are to approach racial reconciliation. I don't think that the Black Lives Matter and all the racial and social justice justicians out there have the, the plan that's going to be successful. I think we need to, no. to embody no. forgiveness. Martin Luther King did it. Jesus did it. I think those two in combination <laughs> are, are, are two <laughs> models that we should follow uh, going forward. Yeah, yeah, that's so good. And so obviously, I say, I say it's obviously the answer, but it's not until you hear it articulated as well as you just did. The easy thing is hate, rage, bitterness, anger, lighting things on fire. That's always going to be the easier things. Uh, what always. you just said and what Booker T. Washington did is always going to be the, the more difficult. But once you start doing it, it's obviously the better. Uh, Derek, so good to talk to you, man. Can we do it again? Absolutely. Absolutely. We'd love to. Yeah, D-E-R-R-Y-C-K green.com. And that's your uh, Twitter, too. D-E-R-R-Y-C-K green. Uh, and Project 21. Beautiful, Derek. Absolutely. Have a great day, brother. All right. Thanks, you too. Thank you, man. True story. Mike Slater. Be back tomorrow. Have a great day. Spread the word.